Welcome to the Debate at GO8 podcast series exploring issues and research affecting the Group of Eight Universities and, by extension, Australia's economy and our society. My name's Ron Candelars. I'm a freelance journalist and producer. And throughout this series, we've been canvassing a range of topics, touching upon the work of all the Group of Eight Universities. They include the Australian National University, Monash University, UNSW Sydney, the Universities of Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney, Queensland and Western Australia. In the Podbooth studio with me is Vicky Thompson, the CEO of the Group of Eight Universities, and we'll be speaking with Professor Duncan Maskell, the Vice-Chancellor of Melbourne University. He's had a remarkable career as an academic and an entrepreneur, and has many valuable insights about the commercialisation of research, the university's role in combating climate change, and music, from the specials to Shostakovich. In fact, he's recently overseen an exciting partnership between the University of Melbourne and the Australian Chamber Orchestra. Professor Maskell, you only recently announced a, a first for an Australian university, the establishment of two major investment funds in partnership with Breakthrough Victoria and Tanara Capital, dedicated to supporting Melbourne's world-leading researchers as they strive to turn their discoveries into commercial reality. How will these funds work? Well, uh, they are, there are two funds. One fund is the Genesis Pre-Seed Fund, and that's uh, a $15 million fund, $7.5 million from the Breakthrough Victoria and $7.5 million from us. And that's to take things at pretty early stage. We already have a proof of concept fund, and it's to take things uh, beyond the proof of concept and out into getting the company ready for, for seed funding effectively. But then the second fund is uh, Tin Alley Ventures, as you say, which is a uh, $100 million fund with p- potential perhaps to become a $200 million fund. And that's uh, really to scale companies up from seed right out into exit. So, yeah, getting what we're trying, what we're trying to do is populate the whole uh, pipeline, if you like, right from invention all the way through to exit with money that we can, we can support people with. Uh, you know, I've said many times before, I'm a massive advocate for basic research. I think it's entirely appropriate that we do research into areas that are completely esoteric and have no no translatability at all in some sense. <laughs> but if we've got stuff which is translatable, then we should translate it. And if that involves commercialization as well, then we should commercialize. And, you know, I, I do need to make the difference between translation and commercialization. They are not the same thing. So uh, what's the difference? Can, how, how do you define the difference? Translation is, is about, so I'll give you an example from my past. Mm. We had somebody in my veterinary school in Cambridge a long, long time ago and she invented a new way of fixing a dog's cruciate ligament. Uh, it's pretty hard. I, I can't. I, I don't know how we'd monetize that. I'm sure you could somehow, but you know, the best thing to do there was to get the thing out there, uh, tell all of our colleagues uh, in 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 the field uh, about how to do that, and you know, it became quite widely adopted. This is a much better way of, of fixing that that issue. So uh, for me, that's translated research, but it's not commercialized. Having said all of that, I'm, I'm a fan of commercialisation. If we can commercialise it, then why not? We should. How interested are private companies in investing in university projects that might be commercialised one day? Do you have a lot of interest you know, behind this announcement? Well, it depends what you mean by private companies. I mean, you know, there are going to be, I imagine there'll be uh, private companies who might even be interested in taking some of the action in, in, in the Tin Valley, uh, Tin Alley Ventures Fund. But uh, we, we get approached fairly often by companies to come and work with us. Uh, so, so just as an example, in fact, I noticed this morning on LinkedIn, Arthur Sinodinos, the ambassador of Australia to the United States, was in San Diego and mentioned our university because he was visiting Illumina. And uh, Illumina is one of the world's biggest genome sequencing companies. And they have their Asia Pacific headquarters based here at the University of Melbourne, in a building just over there. Uh, that's a relationship that we've formed with Illumina, which has brought investment onshore into Australia from the west coast of the US. Uh, which is a, a fantastic uh, arrangement. They're not in, they're not investing in a particular small company or anything like that. They're investing in the university as a whole, and those kinds of longer term relationships with big companies, I think, are just as important as as, as the front end uh, entrepreneurship with small companies. Do you expect many alumni to also leap on board in terms of you know investing in research as well? Um, after these announcements regarding these funds? Yeah, I hope so. I can't expect, I suppose, <laughs> but I can hope. And um, I think quite a few of our alumni have already expressed an interest in, in, in the funds. Of course, Tanara Ventures is run by uh, John Wiley, who's one of our alums. 
so um, I'm 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 pretty hopeful that we will have alumni uh, investing in the fund. The funds are also available for students, uh, affiliated institutes, and alumni to to, to get investment from as well uh, in in the other direction. These so, things don't um, happen but, overnight, right? I mean, there's a lot of work that goes into getting this to the point where you've got the announcement and you can celebrate it. And I'm just wondering, you know, what is the value proposition for companies and for investors into broadly university research commercialisation? And what is the role for government in facilitating that? The value proposition is is kind of obvious in, the, in, in that we are, we've got great ideas in universities those ideas can often be made into companies which do become commercially successful. We all know that the whole venture capital world is 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 um, it, it's not a it's, uh, it's it's not a foregone conclusion. So, you know, people would be tending to put their high risk money in uh, into a venture capital kind of fund like this. But you know, m- most most uh, people with the kind of money you'd need to invest in the fund do have some money available, which is for high risk ventures. And, you know, the, the value proposition in a sense is, is that it's a uh, high risk but high gain potentially. Mm. Um, in terms of a broader thing, though, from a university's perspective, I, I'm, I'm, as I've said many times before, I'm, I'm very clear that universities exist at the whim of society in some sense. And, and the social contract we have is to serve society for the privilege of being a university. And one of the ways we, many ways we serve society, but one of the ways we can serve society is to do great research that has outcomes for people and outcomes for society. And usually the best way to get that out there, you know, big style, is, is, is to commercialise things and to invest in those things. So I think a lot of people coming into investing in the fund will be looking for a financial return, certainly, but they'll also get the pleasure and joy of investing in the university they love if they're alums, and also the, the, the joy and pleasure of, of actually doing something good for the world. You know, this should not be underrated, I reckon. How do you rate Australia's performance when it comes to commercialising innovations and scientific breakthroughs at our universities? Well, I think we do okay. I think, I think the doom and gloom argument, which says we do terribly badly, is, is, is not entirely accurate. But we don't do as well as we should. There's no doubt about that. So I think there's, there, there is more work that we can do to improve that. Um, I don't have any off-pad answers why that is necessarily, but, uh, you know, I, I, I just think so sometimes it's, people think it's easy to transplant a, a, a commercialization ecosystem from one place to another. So why don't we just transplant Stanford's model to Melbourne, let's say, or Oxford's model to Sydney or something, you know. Well, it doesn't work like that. You know, you've got to have a model and an ecosystem that actually works for your own culture and for your own system. And so that's what we've been trying to do. We've been trying to Take the bet. In this recent announcement, we've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes, talking to Oxford, talking to Cambridge, talking to MIT, talking to Auckland, uh, talking to Imperial, all sorts of other people, Stanford, then trying to see how we can fit things around such that we generate a, a system here that's fit for purpose within our country and with our university and with our people. And that's kind of how you need to do it, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And we'll see how it works. You know, it could be uh, a while before it really gets going. Um, I'm hoping it won't be. In fact, the interest we've had so far just since the announcement has been phenomenal. Could you give us a few examples of research done by Melbourne University startups that have been commercialised that, you know, could sort of be a beacon for some of these people? Well, the one that always is mentioned is Cochlear. Cochlear is a great company, but I'm kind of tired of trying that one out, even though it's just a great company. But uh, there was a company that was founded from Melbourne not that long ago, which was still invested in, called Synchron. That's now, that's now um, headquartered in New York, and Synchron is making brain implants, which uh, it sounds like science fiction, uh, and I'm sure I'm going to get this slightly wrong. But effectively, these implants register brain waves and can turn them into intentional acts. Mm. So in other words, you can be thinking about typing something on the computer, and it will type it for you. So this, this is a brilliant uh, amazing thing. That is that a brilliant will, breakthrough for neurological diseases and people suffering yeah, from I mean, like multiple sclerosis or whatever, whatever well, the case may stuff, be. You know, yeah. it, 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 it enables it to become functional in society again, basically. Mm. Another one is SEER Medical, which I think is the putting a, another is, is another sort of interface thing. It's actually uh, on the scalp, but it will detect signals which will tell you that you're about to go into having an epileptic fit. And so, you know, this is really, really important. You know, so, so you've got pre warning, basically. It's a brilliant idea and it works really well. So that's now out there looking for more investment. It's, that's going to be very successful. But it's not just that. We have social enterprises too. I mean, I was at the opening, uh, the launch uh, two days, two weeks ago. 
there were two different ones. One was called Let's Chat Dementia, which is about converting a lot of the research we've done in our Graduate School of Education into a, a social purpose company, effectively, that's operating in Northwest Australia with the um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people about brain health. And the other one was called Next Level Collaboration. And that's, uh, uh, again, a couple of people from our uh, education uh, department, who one of whom is neurodiverse herself, who have set up a social purpose venture to um, use gaming to help neurodiverse kids. Mm. Extraordinary. It's a mm. fantastic company. It's doing really well. Uh, and and it, that's the kind of entrepreneurship we want to see. Professor Maskell, prior to taking up your position as the 20th Vice-Chancellor Vice of Melbourne University, you were Senior Pro-Vice-Chancellor at the University of Cambridge. And I understand you were the first in your family to attend university. Is that right? Yep, I was the first in family to attend university. My dad was a plumber and my mum for a while worked in a factory before she moved into the office. My grandparents, for example, in their house, they had a tin bath and an outside toilet. So... <laughs> And they brought up five children in that house, uh, including my dad. So, so uh, yeah, I come from that kind of background in North London. Um, I was really lucky to go to a decent school. It was a comprehensive school, state school, but it was a pretty good school. And it, they had a tradition of sending people to university. So I got that opportunity. And my mum and dad were very supportive of that. And I went to university in 1979 in the UK when education was at the expense of the taxpayer, not the individual. So um, I hesitate to agree, but you know, and that that without that, if I'd have had to have the current system of loans, etc., well, I probably wouldn't have gone to university. And of course, not just any university. You went to Cambridge. I went to Cambridge, yeah, and I did my degree and my PhD there, which was a revelation. Uh, the first two terms for you in or Cambridge, for them? Yeah, three term <laughs> system in Cambridge. The first two terms in Cambridge, I was kind of coasting and enjoying yeah. being there and meeting new friends and plenty of beer, I have to confess, and playing a lot of music. Listening to the my, specials. One of, my, one, of my, one of my supervisors, one of my tutors uh, sat me down and said, you know, you're quite a smart lad, Duncan, but you're going to do nothing if you don't knuckle down and do some work. So that was a that was a bit of a wake-up call. So uh, yeah, great. So, so what set you on this path to become an advocate for um, res education and, and the value of research? Well, education, because I think education gives people opportunity. I wouldn't have had that opportunity without without having a good education, a university education. And many of my friends at school and also in university have, have gone on to, to have good lives because they had the opportunity to get an education. I think education is also very important for having a healthy society. It doesn't always work. You still get educated people who <laughs> say stupid things. But uh, I think, you know, if you, if you, if you don't have an edu education system that, that uh, sort of works, then you, 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 will, you will have a an uneducated population who won't be a civilised country in, in those terms, if you want to put it in those terms. So I think education is incredibly important at, at so many different levels. And research, similarly, uh, it's not just about... Research is often couched in terms of solving problems. It's not just about solving problems. My Dean of Arts here, Russell Goldburn, once challenged me on when I was using language like that. And, and his view is that it's just as much about asking basic questions like, what is it to be human, for example, which is which covers a multitude of sins. And I agree with him, you know, the... the the, the basic philosophical and esoteric and knowledge-based questions that we all have about existence need to be addressed in deep, deep ways. And do you think that's becoming more challenging to do that in the current political context? And I don't just mean the Australian political context, but more broadly, that, that there is yeah. a, a risk that universities are seen as big, as businesses, and we are big businesses in and of ourselves, but we lose that sort of integrity that you're talking about. You've mentioned yeah. esoteric a couple of times now, but we lose I think, that. I think we're at great risk of losing that, and mm. I think it would be terrible if we lost that. You know, I, I would make I would make every single science student do at least one course on philosophy just so they understand the epistemology of what they do and understand the methodologies of knowledge, for example. I, I don't think you can do one without the other. I think the simplistic idea that, that we are here just to solve problems is, is wrong. And I think actually a lot of society's problems that we might want to solve, you don't solve just with science. Mm. Uh, if you look at climate change, for example, yes, there are technological issues there and technological answers to some of it, but much more of it, it, it revolves around many of the sort of humanities and social science type questions and, and problems that, that, that underpin things. Uh, similarly, with the pandemic, for example, the uh, you know as an infectious disease person, um, I think about this a lot. Of course, there are technological answers to some of it, like new drugs and vaccines and everything else. But if you think about it, a lot of the things that w most people went through to do with the pandemic were because of decisions of governments. And I'm not just talking about ours, who incidentally, I think, made most of the right decisions, to be fair, both state and, and, and federal level. 
Uh, but it's, but you know, it's decisions of government that lock you down. The pandemic doesn't make you get locked down. You know, mm. it's obvious mm. that you probably should lock down to save people's lives or pr- prolong their lives. But, but it, it is, it, it is decisions of government. So therefore, you have to understand the ethical framework within which you can take those decisions, the legal framework, uh, political framework, the sociology of that. Is is saving people's lives now against a virus the right thing to do in the context of a long term effects on their health? Et cetera, et cetera. All of those questions are really, really difficult questions, which are not necessarily scientific questions, and rely, you know, quite a lot on, or well, hell of a lot on the on humanities, social science mm-hmm. type thinking and subject areas in which people are expert. Mm-hmm. You have been a big advocate of changing the the Australia's research funding model, haven't you? I mean, because uh, there's been this predominance of drawing income from overseas students, et cetera, and you've talked about this need for government to to fund universities more. It seems to me it's it's going back to a model that was abandoned many years ago. Well, I think in terms of research, uh, there's two things there, I'd say. The, the first is um, Australia spends 1.8%, just under 1.8% of its GDP, uh, according to 2019 OECD figures uh, on research, uh, compared with 2.5%, which is the OEC, uh, OECD average so we're undercooked there in terms of the quantum of money going in but the other thing i would say is i'm not saying i'm not saying necessarily that all research should be funded by government what i am saying though is that we should have clarity about the cost of research and then we should so we should we should have a full economic costed model we should have clarity about the cost of research in the universities because all of the back office work that goes on is necessary for the research to be done it's not an optional extra it's not an it's not an indirect cost add-on it's is fundamental to doing the, res- to the research properly. So we should have a handle on how much it costs. And then we should decide, government, society, whatever, should decide what proportion of that the government should pay. And if the government chooses to pay 100% of that, I'm happy with that. They won't, I'm quite sure. But, uh, you know, if it's 80% or whatever, that's fine. And then we can work from there in terms of a, a much more straightforward and sensible system. Today, we've, we've been talking a fair bit about commercialisation of research. And one of the things that fascinated me about your uh, backstory was that when you were a senior vice pro chancellor at uh, Cambridge University, you were responsible for planning in an institution with an annual turnover of about two billion pounds, and you you also established, I think, four biotech companies. That's quite a, an, an amazing track record, and it really points to your skills in identifying a great idea and commercialising it in some way. What, what, what advice would you give to people who want to do that? Well, it wasn't just me. I co-founded companies with, sure. with mates, people who knew what they were doing. So there's, a, there's an issue there. And I think that would be a piece of advice, actually. You don't have to do it on your own. Go and find people who are interested too. Or, you know, usually these ideas aren't just developed by a single individual anyway. They're usually uh, teams or, or two or three people together having the ideas. So that, that's always a good thing to do. I also think that too often founders of companies who are scientists like me stick around too long in trying to run the company. And I do think that having a, even if it's part, a part-time professional CEO is quite an important uh, thing to do early on in the life of a company. Uh, so, you know, people like me can stick around being scientific advisor or even chief scientific officer in the company if that's the structure they have. But stop, try and avoid the temptation to say, this is my baby, I'm going to keep running it forever. Because, you know, with very few exceptions, you're, you're usually not the best person to actually run the company as CEO. So there's a piece of advice too, I reckon. Uh, also, I, I think the, don't, be, don't be afraid to get involved in this whole area is another piece of advice. Uh, a lot of people sort of shy away from it because it's different or new. It's actually very easy. In fact, I, I raised more money uh, with less effort in the commercial world than, than I had, you know, the effort I had to put into research grants and everything else was you know, far more for less money. So put it that way. Once you get on a roll and you get a good idea, uh, you can actually get money for your research you want to do. And it's a, it's a different route and it's less bureaucratic often, although the, the lawyers do get involved eventually, of course. And I think don't, um, don't we have to ha- also have a culture of failure is okay and that sometimes to succeed you have to you know, you will fail. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a cultural thing, particularly or particular to Australia, if we look at other research environments. And obviously, Duncan's more in, involved in this than I am. But if, you, you know, we're always told that Israel is an incredible country in terms of commercialisation, but they actually have a really high risk appetite. 
And we just don't have that. And I don't think we have the the setup and the mechanisms from the government's perspective either to not reward failure, but to understand that actually that is just part of the process. Mm. I'm not going to comment on on the Australian propensity for risk. I've only been here four years. Um, I hesitate to be critical, but I, I do think that uh, what, you know what, with our new funds, certainly with the Genesis Pre-Seed Fund, uh, if we do our job in getting some of our research translated out there, but the company eventually fails, or, or if that's the right word, even it doesn't matter really. You know, the stuff's the, the work's been got out there. Uh, so, so you know, what is failure anyway? I, I you know, I, I do think that these are high risk ventures. It is possible to fail and go again. Mm. Uh, so, as long as we embed that culture somehow, um, I think that's the the way to go. Frankly, just want to move to another area of your um, life and, and uh, the work that you do at Melbourne Uni. Climate change is also on your agenda. Melbourne University has recently launched its new sustainability plan 2030. What are the key features of that plan? We launched already our research umbrella called Melbourne Climate Futures. And in fact, we purposely have um, Professor Jackie Peel is leading it and she's a climate change lawyer. So rather than launching a uh, an umbrella organisation uh, which is uh, science and tech based, we decided to make it clear that, that the Melbourne Climate Futures was going to be a mixture of science and tech, but also uh, law, social science and everything else, like I was trying to explain earlier. So that's a very, been a very big uh, move on our part. I mean, it's really just bringing together a bunch of uh, things that were going on already in the place, but putting them together so they become more visible. Uh, and uh, that's been uh, very interesting. But then we decided that if we were going to do that, then our sustainability, we've always, we, we had a sustainability plan for the last few years anyway, but the, but the sustainability plan we we're going to do needed to be up to scratch uh, in terms of that agenda. And so we've worked hard to produce our sustainability plan 2030. It is setting ourselves some pretty robust targets to be climate neutral, I think by 2025, I can't remember exactly, but I think it's 2025 and we're almost there actually, uh, and uh, climate positive by 2030. And I hadn't really heard of the term climate positive, but I think, mm. yeah, but there it is, carbon positive, sorry, not climate positive, but carbon positive. So uh, that, there, there's, the, there's the overall objective. Within that, we have a whole bunch of smaller objectives to achieve that and get to that. Without looking at the plan, I wouldn't be able to recite them right now. But, but it really uh, is not a, a good example, isn't it, of the role of universities as both thought leaders, policy leaders, like being in front mm. of the game in a sense. And I think that's what, you know, I mean, all of our universities obviously would have particular strategies in place, but Melbourne Uni is, is obviously pretty forward leaning. And I think that's a very good example of the role that we can play in walking the talk. I mean, you've walked the talk You've established the four or co-founded with very smart people, <laughs> your biotech companies. You know, you're now doing this around climate. I know you've, you've, you've also, with the help of your provost, uh, being very proactive in the area of uh, campus, you know, sexual, and, uh, sexual assault on campus and harassment, et cetera. So I think these, are all, these all go point to the fact that Melbourne, like, like I have to say my other seven universities, are very forward-leaning into the public policy agenda. And into the community. And into the community yep. and almost, you know, government is important and we do spend a lot of time in these podcasts talking about the role of government, but we are just kind of getting on with it really, sort of, you know, almost despite government Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in yep. a sense. I mean, that's my own personal view, right. Duncan, but yeah. yeah. I think you're right, mm. Vicky. Uh, what I've been saying a lot over quite a period now is, is trying to emphasise our social obligation. Uh, you know, I think... People forget that that's why we're here. Uh, people external to the university forget that's why we're here. Quite a few of my colleagues in the university sometimes forget that's why we're here. But but that is why we're here. We have a massive social obligation, and then that is involving teaching young people, not just young people as well. Incidentally, increasingly as we go forward, uh, but teaching people, uh, educating them, helping them understand the world in a different way. But then also uh, not just doing the research that helps society progress, but 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 as you say, walking the talk. It'd be ridiculous if we had Melbourne Climate Futures and then didn't have a proper sustainability plan, you know, expecting everyone else to do the dirty work. We've just got to get down and dirty and, and make sure we do the thing. It's all these things are impacting on the broader community. I want to uh, come to something else. I, I noted in the preamble to this interview that uh, you're a music fan with eclectic tastes ranging from the specials to Shostakovich and Beethoven. And obviously music's very important to you. 
You must be proud of the university's collaboration with the Australian Chamber Orchestra. What, what's that about? It's it's one of many collaborations that we have. We're, we're heavily involved in, in ANAM. I spoke at the uh, Australian um, Musical Education Board uh, graduation ceremony a couple of Sundays ago, which is the you know, music exams, uh, uh, playing uh, music exams business. Um, the ACO relationship is really exciting. Uh, although ACO is a Sydney-based uh, orchestra, uh, they do come to Melbourne fairly often. And through a couple of contacts in, in the university, we sort of knew the ACO. And um, in fact, one of our ex-council members, Martin Meyer, introduced me to Richard Tonietti, uh, who, who, who is the lead violinist and director of the ACO. And um, we, we just cooked up a plan whereby uh, we would have a relationship with them. And so we are their education partner. When they're in town, they come and see us. Uh, they do they do work with our students. Uh, they do master classes. Uh, there was a concert the other day in our new Hanson Dyer Hall, which is the university's new conservatorium's main concert hall. It's a beautiful hall, by the way, uh, where Tippy, the, the cellist, played um, played a solo concert with a pianist company accompaniment. Uh, it, it just enriches the whole university. It's, it's a fantastic deal. But we've got lots of other things like that on the go um, that are very exciting. You must be very happy that the students are back uh, on campus. And uh, to quote a line from the specials, this place is coming like a ghost town. You would you would have lived through that on campus at Melbourne Uni. Uh, and it must be fantastic to have all these 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 students back on campus. Uh, yeah, it is very good to, to have them back on campus. Um, we've got a long way to go, actually, you know, and, and with our, with our uh, reasonably high Chinese student number, we're pretty... You know, we're hit reasonably hard by the fact that the Chinese border is effectively still closed. It's hard to get people out of, in or out of China. Um, so there's that issue. But yeah, no, we've got, we've got a lot of people back on campus. Uh, having the students back is great. Uh, immediately lifts the level of vibrancy, uh, increases the level of challenge. Uh, I've been ambushed a couple of times walking around ca- campus by, and it, it's not as benign as it sounds. I make it sound benign, but it's pretty threatening, I have to say, by students who don't like something I've said or done. But that's okay, you know, to some extent. <laughs> uh, so how? But, you know, anyway, it's the whole thing about having a vibrant campus, you know, yeah. it's, it's really good. How have you how have you coped co- um, um, post COVID? How, how's 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 the uni bounced back after the pandemic? Well, I think uh, we 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 throughout the pandemic we were very cautious, we were prudent with our finances, and we tried very hard to take a, a small steps approach so that we didn't actually lose many jobs. I have to say, in the greatest scheme of things, most of the jobs that were lost were voluntary redundancy or early retirement. And the, the, of course, there are a few jobs. Unfortunately, people people lost their jobs and didn't want to lose their jobs. And I regret that massively. It's a horrible thing to happen, but we had no choice at the time. But we have bounced back. Uh, we are bouncing back. Uh, having said that, you know, we made $250 million worth of savings last year. Our accounts are about to be put before Parliament. It will, it will show a healthy surplus, but uh, three quarters of that surplus is revaluation of illiquid assets. And what that means is revaluation of shares and, 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 and uh, endowments and things like that, which we can't spend on anything else other than the endowment uh, intends it for. So that's money that's not available. And of the, uh, of the operating uh, surplus that we've made, a very large chunk of that is explained by the a billion dollar bailout that the federal government belatedly gave us uh, towards the end of the last mm-hmm. year, uh, and the University of Melbourne you know, got a got a fairly big chunk of that because of the way it was di- divided up. So a lot of our operating profit will be taken up uh, with that, and that's in the context of two hundred and fifty million dollars worth of savings. So mm-hmm. we are actually looking like we're in a good place financially, but it's not as good as it as it looks in some sense, having had to make all those savings. This whole podcast, I think, shows you the diversity Mm. of the person who runs the organisation and the diversity of what we do as universities. We started with commercialisation, albeit we ended sort of with a bit of a business discussion. Let's be honest, Duncan, we're talking about surpluses, so it's a little bit businessy. <laughs> and we and, went and, 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 and music. And music in between. Yeah, and climate change. And yeah. I don't believe there is any other CEO role Mm. like that when you're running an organisation. And my point to the last point about people coming back and working on campus, you know, actually vice-chancellors 
aren't like CEOs in that case because academics have this incredible freedom to be able to do what they like to do. So it's very difficult to have a command and control operation. So I think what we're hearing through this podcast is diversity of the institution, but very also very much so the diversity of the person running it. Mm. I think that's I think that's right, Vicky. Absolutely, you, you know, you, you want to have a command and control system, and of course, sometimes it would COVID, be good. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe. before COVID, people were had flexible working, so this is not yeah. a new thing. People had flexible working. Mm. I just think the narrative that's emerging from some people, especially like um, you know, office worker type um, yeah. organisations, that everyone's going to work from home from now on in. I think I think that misses the point to some extent, and it, and and I just hope that universities manage to to continue to get the message across that having a community feel, having people together, is a really important part of what we do. But yeah, the diversity of the job is 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 extreme, and it's uh, it's but it's exciting too. It's great. Your the diversity of your career is quite remarkable, and it's been wonderful talking to you about uh, your career and what's planned for Melbourne Uni in the future. Thanks very much for your time, Professor. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks for your company today. If you'd like more information about the issues raised in this podcast or other related topics, please visit our website at geo8.edu.au. And a quick reminder that you can always tune into the debate at Geo8 on Spotify, Google, Apple or YouTube. Bye for now. Thank you.